Welcome to Perspectives El Paso. I'm Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College, and I have been so since 1972. Here we are in September of 2009, and I have a special guest. He is the first chairman of the Board of Trustees of El Paso Community College. I'm doing a few programs during this anniversary year about El Paso Community College history. Now, I'm going to do something that I, I rarely do on this program. I'm going to read something, and then I'm going to get to Joe Foster to talk about the early part of the history of El Paso Community College. This is from the school newspaper dated October 3, 1974. When well over 3,000 people from an institution the size of El Paso Community College turn out and spend their Saturday in the pouring rain, walking door to door, driving people to polls, and telephoning prospective voters, overwhelming is the only word to describe such an event. Yet that was the scene in El Paso on Saturday, September 21st, 1974. At this time, there were 34 people, including most of the faculty, who opened their homes to volunteers as precinct headquarters. Each headquarter had approximately 30 to 60 walkers, 6 to 10 drivers, and 1 to 2 people stationed at each poll to distribute material supporting EPCC. All polls in the voting district were covered by poll workers and the drivers from each headquarters covered several precincts. Calls were made during the morning to establish which residents needed rides to the polls. As the drivers took off with their assignments, volunteers began walking door to door in predetermined areas to urge the citizens to get out and vote. And on the front page of this particular article here is a picture of me with a very black beard at that time talking to three students preparing them to go to work in the bond issue. Joe Foster, welcome to this program. Perspectives El Paso. Thanks for having me, Leon. It's been a few years, 40 years, this college has been in existence from the time the vote was taken creating this college. Tell us about those beginnings, the seeds of those beginnings. Who were the people that planted these seeds to start this college? The college was the idea of Albert Horowitz, who was Joe Christie's father-in-law. Mm -hmm. They had toured a community college in uh, Corpus Christi, I believe it was. And uh, Albert Horwitz, who was an industrial man, thought we needed a community college very badly in El Paso. So he mentioned it to Joe Christie, who went and looked at the community college and thought, you know, that's correct. That's what we need. And what was Joe Christie's position? Joe was our state senator. Okay. And probably the best state senator we ever had. He's, he was just a wonderful man. Great. So we, um, uh, I guess it was a December December in 68, just before the end of the year, uh, I was sitting in my office in the El Paso National Bank building, which is now the Chase Bank building, okay. and the door opened, and it was about six o'clock in the evening, and in walks Joe Christie. And he said, uh, Joe, I'm gonna have a meeting tonight at seven o'clock to discuss a community college in El Paso, and I'd like you to come. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll be happy to come. Now, what kind of business were you in? Real estate. In real estate, okay, yes. go ahead. So. Um, uh, I went and t went to the meeting and he had a, a list there and uh, there were probably a hundred people there and they all had designations uh, of things they were going to do in this effort to create a community college. You had to have a certain percentage of the voters approve it and, and all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sat there listening to it and, and he had this piece of paper with a bunch of names and at the very top he had chairman and co-chairman and his name was chairman. Uh, uh, and uh, he said, and my co-chairman is Joe Foster. And I about fell out of my chair. He just dropped it on you. Dropped it on me. I'd, <laughs> we'd never discussed it or anything. Oh, my. And I thought, boy, what a, what a task. So, so starting in January, we got organized and started to, to get ready for the election in, in June. And Joe Christie went back to Austin to, to do things down there. And now, didn't you have some people in the community said, we don't need a junior college or community college here? We have... Texas Western had become oh, UTEP? Sure. Yes, sure. They thought we didn't need it and they were afraid we would compete with UTEP in the uh, sports arena. Mm -hmm. And we had to, we agreed at that point we wouldn't have sports. And uh, people were very nervous about it. They didn't want to pay taxes too. And, and right. So now then, uh, who were some of the other people? You had an election. We had an there election. There was an election to create the college and that was in 1969? 1969. Okay. And June, June of 
69. And then you had an election to choose members to the board, and you got elected. I got to elected the board. as with six other board members. Okay, six other board members. Uh, when I was teaching at uh, Texas Western, and I, I graduated there from 1967 with a master's in political science when they first changed the name to UT El Paso. And we worked for a man named Joe Yarbrough, uh, managing apartments while I was teaching. And I'd seen an obituary in the congressional record that Joe had died of a heart attack. And it mentioned that he was on this community college board of trustees. And that's how I made a contact and ended up being hired here, was just from seeing his name listed and making a contact with someone I knew at UTEP. Uh, the election was for a two-year period as a board member? I don't remember that, Leon. You don't remember what it was, two years or four years? I was saying it was about two years. But you remember Joe Yarbrough, who was on the board oh, with you very well. in those very early years. He was a building developer. But he was also very active in politics. Yes, he was on the State Democratic Executive Committee, very closely related to Joe Christie, the state senator, who was a Democrat. So then you had some other early board members that really helped you get this thing going. You want to name some of those? Well, there was Earl Williams. Earl was uh, the head of BDM International, mm -hmm. which was a top secret uh, uh, organization. And um, he shortly thereafter, he was very pro-community college, thought it was just absolutely necessary. But then right after the election, we, we uh, formed the board and things like that. Mm -hmm. Earl left. He had to move to Virginia to they moved their company out of El Paso. Okay. Then there was Ted Karam, who was a builder. Uh, Ted was probably uh, uh, the most surprising candidate because he had never been been involved in things like that, and, and it was gracious of him to, to join our board. Uh, Albert Horowitz, then, who was Joe Christie's father-in-law, was on there, and uh, Prince of a Man, and uh, Tom Prendergast, and Dr. E.A. Aguilar, who was one of our better dentists in town. Mm -hmm. The other dentists may take exception to that. But, uh, <laughs> a very nice man, by the way. I mean, good yeah. man, yeah. And I don't know if I've forgotten anybody. There are, by the way, only two of us left. Mm -hmm. uh, Earl Williams and I are the surviving two board members. Wow. And so you have a lot of fond memories of these 40 years and you've seen the school grow. Oh, so, yes. so we're looking at the seeds. Of, uh, didn't you have some UTEP professors that were also supporting this college? Sure. Dr. Ken Beasley, who was head of the graduate school at UTEP. Right. He signed my master's thesis. And he ended up going on our board at, at a later date, mm -hmm. but while I was still chairman of the board. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very pro-community uh, college. Mm -hmm. Most educated people were in favor of the community college. Okay. The, the only objections we had were because people didn't want their taxes raised. Right. Well, I can understand that. We're a low-income community, and we had a lot of uh, military retired people that did not want their taxes to go up. In fact, when I uh, drove into El Paso, uh, having accepted the contract, signed it, and was you know, entering town, was on talk radio, people calling and opposing the college. Here I am driving into town. The governor had vetoed some of the money for the college, and people calling in and opposing the college, mainly on the grounds that uh, their taxes were going to go up. Also, that why should we have another college when UTEP is already here. Now, what did you perceive that this college could offer that UTEP was not offering? We had uh, no strings on going to college. Open as admissions. Open, open admissions. Anyone okay. could go. All you had to do was go take a course. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do that at UTEP. Mm -hmm. And also a variety of programs that UTEP didn't offer in vocational oh, right. and technical that's, training fields. That's true. Okay. Uh, now then, okay, let's move. We got the foundation there and the seeds of this college getting started and you helping to lead the board in that direction. Then there was a need for facilities because when I signed a contract, I was told there were no facilities, that the classes were being taught at Thomason Hospital uh, and some classrooms there and at Bowie High School and some other places in town. So uh, what did you do to approach that when you didn't have any buildings and the voters were voting against taxing themselves for them? Well. It was after our third uh, bond issue, I guess, that we went out and leased some property from Fort Bliss. The, uh, uh, the Logan Heights uh, basic training camp was no longer going to be utilized by the, by the Army, so we signed a lease with them and, and had facilities there to open, open the school. Well, the article I read from a few minutes ago from the school paper in 1974, it mentions there was no one person that really was most responsible for getting that bond issue through. It was really a joint effort many, many people were working on it. You were working on it. One of my colleagues, uh, Blaine Nelson, who had just come to teach here, he 
was good in statistics and uh, computer information and things, and he helped us to get a lot of statistics so we could target who we were going to try to turn out to get the vote. Do you recall that? Sure, but, but what we had, we had run two previous bond issues and had failed on both of them. Mm -hmm. The Texas law at that time was that the only way you could vote in a bond issue was if you owned property. They wouldn't let uh, apartment dwellers, as an example, uh, vote in a bond issue. So we were going to let everybody vote. That was number one thing. And, and we, after losing two of them, we've, we, we determined that we've got to get our people out, the people who like the community college. So we got organized in how to do, as how to do that, and, uh, and it worked. Well, what had happened was the courts had said that non-real property owners, people who didn't own real estate, could vote in bond issues, but their vote didn't count as the same as people that owned real property, real estate. And so the, the way it was set up, and we had to deal with all of this, was that you had to win a majority of, of all the boxes in the county voting for the bond issue, and then you had to win all of the property owners' boxes that were voting for the issue, but non-property owners' votes didn't count as much. You had to win a majority of all boxes, a majority of property owning boxes. The way the election came out in 74, <laughs> we won a majority of all boxes and the renters' boxes, and we were told we lost the election. So your lawyers, uh, Mark Berry and Ed Dunbar, filed a friend of the court brief to go to the Supreme Court with a case from Fort Worth already on the way. And some of us recall that was a library bond issue. Others recall that it was a community college bond issue. But regardless, the U.S. Supreme Court declared this Texas law unconstitutional. That's correct. That renters' ballot should count the same value as an actual property owner's ballot because of a pass-through concept. That renters' right, rent goes up when the taxes go up. And it was on that basis that El Paso Community College became a landmark case of uh, changing Texas law so that th everybody's vote counted the same. Didn't you feel proud about that? I did. I went, to, went and appeared before the Supreme Court. <laughs> you did? I didn't, I didn't get up and talk, but I mean, I was there. You went up to see the case. We did. Presented it and heard from it the was Fort Worth. really, really interesting. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, we would not have had the money to build the buildings. So, uh, part right. of it was for maintenance tax, and other was part for the building of the buildings. Yeah, but we had kind of solve some of that problem. Tom Hatfield, who was the representative of the coordinating board for our area, mm -hmm. Dr. Tom Hatfield, had devised a plan whereby we could, we could count some of our students that are in school and get state funds because of their, their attendance. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he went to Joe Christie and, and proposed that, and they got that passed in the legislature. So we got some state funds before we ever had a property tax. Right. There was another very unusual thing in that anyone in the state, according to another Supreme Court decided before ours was decided, was that if you would declare at least $50 of your own personal property, not real estate, but personal property, like a radio, television, or some trailer or something, then you could vote as a property owner. So some people at community college were actually getting people to register their items so they could vote as property owners. There were so many interesting variables in this very hot topic in El Paso, Texas at that time. And you were right on top of it. I was. Okay, now tell us about the contract with Fort Bliss so we got to use those buildings at Logan Heights, the rock pile. Well, they were vacant. Uh, I, on a side note, I had gone through basic training at, in those very facilities. Oh, my goodness. And uh, uh, so I was very familiar with them. But mm -hmm. we had a wonderful general out there, General Shoemate, and uh, he assisted us and, and, and worked out a lease with us. and. and they were vacant, so they, they were happy to let us have them. As I recall, it was a five-year lease, and then we got a renewal for two more years, but then they said they would not renew it, so we had to have buildings built by then. Uh, you signed a contract with Price's Dairy for the first big property where the Vizierty campus is located. Do you remember those negotiations? Well, I, I knew the Price family, and that's, that's why, and I knew it was vacant land, and they didn't need it for dairy in, anymore, so... Uh, we approached them on it and, and got, a, I think, a very good price on it. It was very centrally located. Right. I think just prior to that, though, we had uh, worked out a deal with the El Paso Independent School District to take over the downtown facility, which is our health-related facility here. Right. Now called the Rio Grande campus. Yeah. Also, if I remember, Fred Hervey, who owned Circle K stores, had said he would give us some land way out on the east side, uh, near where the Las Palmas Shopping Center is now. 
and the decision was made to make it more centrally located by taking the Price's property. I think that's true. And that in itself was controversial, that we didn't accept the free land out there on the east side of town. It made a lot of sense to me. Oh, yes, I thought so, too. I certainly did. Uh, so we had the, the facilities and the buildings, and we finally got the Valle Verde campus. It opened in 1978. And then we ran into problems with state government there with getting money for the Trans Mountain campus to open. And so we kept running into these hurdles, and some of you had to stay on top of that. How many years did you serve as board chairman? Seven years. Seven years, the first seven years. Wow. Yes, goodness, sir. Gracious. It, it put some gray hairs in your head. And I remember Bonnie, your secretary, uh, she was always answering the phone and dealing with things as we ran out of your office dealing with some of these things. And uh, you want to say anything about her helping you through all of these seven years? She was solid, <laughs> right behind us all the way. Solid. Yes. It's good to have a secretary like that, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And, uh, and know, knows how to deal with things for you. Okay, so now let's deal with uh, personnel. You hired Dr. Alfredo de los Santos to be the first president for the college. Tell us about that hiring situation and process. Yes, the, the dean of the Un University of Texas organization that trained community college administrators. Yeah, down had, in Austin? Yes, right. had recommended Alfredo de los Santos as uh, as the man we ought to talk to about the job. Mm -hmm. I forgot where we found him. He was up north someplace, as, as I recall, and we brought him in and, and uh, interviewed him and, and offered him the job, and he accepted. Right. A wonderful man. And then he brought in uh, some of the people with him that you uh, had to hire as a vice president, uh, academic deans, people like this. He made all kinds of staff recommendations, and we followed him. Yeah, you, you pretty well understood. He was sure. the leader in the academic field and oh, the technical absolutely. nursing training fields and all of that to try to get it going. Our job was to support, support him. Right. And then uh, a few years later, uh, he leaves, and uh, w uh, another president comes in. I was on the search committee for the second president, Dr. Robert Shepak. I remember him well. Yeah, we brought in five people that we recommended from the applications that were sent in. And uh, you interviewed those five people and chose Dr. Shepak. Why is Dr. Shepak? He had far more extensive background than, than, uh, than the other candidates. And in addition to that, he was an architect. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about building buildings and things like that. Thought he could be a big help to us. Right. Uh, he came from a uh, community college in Ohio, which was a multi-campus institution. And uh, being an architect, those were th among the reasons why we asked him to come down for an interview with, uh, with you as a board. Okay, so we have the personnel there and programs that were put in place. Uh, your board simply accepted what Alfredo was bringing to you, saying we need to get these points of our curriculum put together, and you said, okay, and let's go with that. Sure. Uh, did you see any, what about the newspapers in, in all of this, of this beginning of this college and hiring of uh, personnel and things like this? Did you know uh, Bill Latham and Pete Lee, the editors of the newspaper at that time? I sure did. And you worked closely with them in getting stories out there and information out there about the college? They covered the college very well. Uh -huh. And uh, so these were things that I think were important, the publicity that you got, positive publicity. I've said all along, our best recruitment people are our students. And so you were getting acquainted with some of the students at the college too, weren't you? Yes. Uh particularly at graduation time. <laughs> <laughs> you got to shake hands with all the students that we came did. by at graduation yeah. time. And, and look out with pride at these families. Did you hear, I hear, I hear this a lot. No one hears as much now as they used to. But some student will say, I'm the first student in my family that has ever gone to college. Didn't you hear that a lot? All the time. The, the, the community college just opened the door for so many people. I, I have said ever since that it was the number one thing that happened to El Paso in the 20th century. The creation of the community college yes. view is the most outstanding most thing that happened. Most in the important century. thing that happened to the city of El Paso in, in that century. Well, that's a, that's a big uh, thing to say, and of course, being the board chairman, it's like it's your baby <laughs> that you helped get started. Well, that's true, but then look, you helped us get there early on. Well, that's some some of us were a part of that. Uh, I, I, I've said on other programs that I had a colleague one time, uh, Leela McDonald uh, by name, who's now also uh, passed on. And one time we were sitting next together, uh, moving from one spot to another for, for some meeting. And she said, um, don't you feel great about getting this job at this new school and helping to get it started from the ground up and we can grow with the institution? 
And I said, I certainly do. I think it's great to get in on the ground floor of a new institution. Later, she moved on up, got her doctorate, and became my boss. She became <laughs> dean of liberal arts, oh, as God. we called it at that time. So a number of people did that. They helped lay the foundation and get it going. And uh, Margaret Langford, you remember Margaret Langford? I do. She was on the board. She was. And then she moved over and became one of our colleagues uh, in the government department. She too has already died and passed on. So some of these people, their shadows are still here that they helped lay this foundation for this school. Uh, now let's look from your place where you are today. I'm not gonna ask your age. You don't have to tell your age today, but it's been 40 years that this institution has been in place and you helped put it in place. Over these 40 years, you've heard stories, you've seen things. Dr. Rhodes, our current president, you see him on television, you know him personally. What are your feelings about looking back at things that have happened in all of these years? You know, I, I always thought the school would be a great success. I didn't dream that it'd be as, as phenomenal a success as what it has become. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is because of Dr. Rhodes and, and, uh, and you guys on the, on the faculty and the administrative staff and, and the current board, me board members. They've all done a good job. Uh, but if you asked me if I thought it would ever turn out like this, it, uh, I'd be fibbing. <laughs> but didn't you see something happening there in the first few years where enrollment was doubling? Sure. And, and all of a sudden here we are at 1,000 students and 3,000 students and 7,000 students and here we are now around 28,000 students uh, in credit classes or something and, and maybe 8,000 more in all kinds of continuing education and special training classes. and. Do you go to some of these different campuses? I know you, I've seen you on this campus walking through, looking around with great nostalgia. Have you been to the other campuses? Have you been to the Northwest campus? I've been to the Northwest campus. And you walk through there and, and it brings great memories. And you, sure. have you, you've been to the Rio Grande campus, of course. Oh, yeah. Because that's where the Allied Health Department was You placed. know, I'm so proud of having had a part in, in this uh, creation of this school. And the benefit you know, there are no monetary rewards for it. It's, it's, it's a reward for something that went really well, something that was good for the community. Right. And like when my father was dying, he, we had uh, nurses that had trained at the community college, technicians here and there. And, and so you, you see what you created and what, uh, what has transpired. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Just recently I went for an MRI, a minor problem, and the young man says, you were my professor. And here he is, he's running this thing on my side. <laughs> and uh, he says, you were my professor everywhere I go. I get my teeth clean and I'll ask people, uh, where did you get your training? El Paso Community College. And on and on it goes every day. Yesterday, I uh, saw two of my former students at an event that I was attending. And they come in. And one of the good things they'll say, Mr. Blevins, you haven't changed at all in the last 20 years. And I'll say, well, my beard turned gray. <laughs> so yes. And so you have been assisted. We've all benefited from the fact that El Paso Community College is here. Sure, my dental hygienist got her training at the community college. Right. Now, as I remember hearing, and, and I was in a campaign one time with some others in the re-election of uh, Lightborn and Carum and Prendergast, and some of you put up your own money to get this school going. Didn't you borrow money? Or at we least did. they borrowed money? Yeah, the board members all signed a personal note that was seed money to get the school started. Right. And that was at a time when uh, people didn't make as much money as they do today. And no, I guess everything is relative. Yeah, but, right. And so they were able to get, it, to get it going. But how often do you see board members anywhere sign in personally? That's right. And then, of course, time. You've invested time. They invested time and money. And it does cost money to be involved on a board. Sure. The, I told you about our December meeting where I agreed to become the co-chairman of the steering committee right. to start it. Well, I determined I'd make about $100,000 in, in 1969. And because of this, the involvement in the community college, I didn't come anywhere near that. I spent all my time on the community college. But it was a worthy investment. Oh, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Right. Okay, we have about three minutes remaining. So there are your three minutes. What, what recollections would you like to share with the people of El Paso Community College, your perspective about this school before we close off? Well, I think the community is very fortunate to have had uh, uh, people get behind this and, and uh, get it start, started. It, uh, uh, it's a phenomenal success. It, uh, there's no way to fault it for anything. 
and uh, I'm very proud of it, and, and uh, as are all of the people that I know that, that have worked on it that are still around. Right. Well, recently I've seen some of the uh, uh, surviving spouses of some of the previous board members, and uh, they have such great memories about this institution. And I saw our Arturo Lightborn, uh, and I was doing a parade recently, and there he was on the parade route waving and, and, and all these kind of things. So these are wonderful memories of El Paso Community College. We hope those of you that have tuned in today watching Perspectives El Paso, you now have a better perspective about this institution that really belongs to you, the taxpayers of El Paso County. Thanks for supporting us and helping us. I'm Leon Blevins, Professor of Government at El Paso Community College. We'll see you on a future program.